So it was uh, Dr. Paul's birthday last night, and uh, although he might be one year older, he still parties like he was about 18, and uh, I'm a little bit the worse for wear. Um, there's only one thing that's going to sort me out today, a can of Coca-Cola, never, never fails. So where did the idea of Coke originally come from? Well, there's no doubt it was influenced by European drinks developed in the mid-1800s called coca wine. Coca wine was made by taking coca leaves and treating it with alcohol. The alcohol helped extract cocaine from the coca leaves, altering the drink's effect. An early example of coca wine was Van Mariani, a French tonic wine, and it contained ethanol and cocaine and was incredibly popular. It was drunk by royalty, such as Queen Victoria, and it was even endorsed by the Pope. Pope Leo appeared on an advertisement and gave it the Gold Vatican Medal for his seal of approval. In 1885, John Pemberton, probably inspired by drinks like Vin Mariani, decided to make his own version of coca wine, only without using ethanol. It was when Atlanta passed Prohibition in 1886 that Pemberton developed Coca-Cola, taking coca leaves and extracting them to take the cocaine out of the leaf and to make a tonic drink on that basis. In addition to the presence of coca leaves, there was another important ingredient in that early Coca-Cola, and that was the cola nut. And from the cola nut, you extract the other original active ingredient of Coca-Cola, which is caffeine. So the very original formula for Coca-Cola relied on a carbonated drink with extract of coca leaves and extract of cola nut, cocaine and caffeine, Coca-Cola. It may seem surprising to modern sensibilities that basically a drink containing cocaine should become so popular and widely accepted. However, you have to remember there was a long tradition of taking medicinal herbs and plants such as nicotine from the tobacco plant and using them for recreational purposes. In 1903, the cocaine was finally removed from Coca-Cola and there were large advertising campaigns to advertise the fact that it really contained no cocaine and there was nothing harmful. They still extracted the coca leaves in order to get the flavour of the Coca-Cola, but they now used coca leaves where the cocaine had previously been pre-extracted from the leaf before they treated it. So once the cocaine had been removed from Coca-Cola, the remaining stimulant was caffeine, and there had been attempts to remove caffeine itself from Coca-Cola, but fortunately for the Coke Corporation, they were stopped and they were allowed to retain caffeine within their drinks. If you're having a look at the chemical structure of caffeine, but it acts on the brain on the same receptors as adenosine. Here you can have a look at the structure of adenosine, a natural biological molecule. And what you'll notice is that there are big similarities between the structure of adenosine and the structure of caffeine. That's the reason that caffeine can act on the same brain receptors as adenosine. And this is the way that caffeine has its effects on the brain, making the brain stay more alert. A can of Coca-Cola typically contains about 34 milligrams of caffeine. And that's interesting because the dose of caffeine required to make you feel more alert is somewhere between 25 and 50 milligrams. So a can of Coke is pretty much perfectly set up to increase your brain alertness. After water, the second largest ingredient in Coca-Cola is sugar. In a single can of Coca-Cola, you have 35 grams of sugar. That means this is 10% sugar solution. That's about seven to eight teaspoons of sugar in a single can. So here's a quick experiment to demonstrate the effect of all that sugar in a can of Coca-Cola. So what I have here is two cans of Coke. One is standard Coke and the other is Diet Coke. What I have here is a beaker of water. So first of all, we're going to see what the can of standard Coke does in this mixture. We can see that when you place the can of Coke in the standard mix, it's sinking to the bottom of the beaker. And it's not just that an air bubble is trapped under there. If I fold it over, you'll see that can of Coke is still sunk at the bottom. Let's just zoom in on that. So now let's take a look what happens with the can of Diet Coke in the same mix. 
Put the Diet Coke in, I push it to the bottom, and you can see the can of Diet Coke is much more buoyant. The lack of sugar in the liquid is lowering the density of the liquid in that can of Coke, and therefore the can of Coke is floating in the mix. Just to show you the two together, Standard Coke and Diet Coke. The Standard Coke is sinking and the Diet Coke is floating. And you're looking here at the structure of sucrose. Sucrose is a sugar. Sugar is actually a class of molecules containing carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, so-called carbohydrate molecules. And sucrose is table sugar. And you can see it's a combination of a glucose unit and a fructose unit. Glucose is the ultimate form of sugar within the human body. For example, it's glucose that diabetics have problems with controlling in terms of their blood levels of sugar. And you're looking here at the structure of glucose. What I'd like you to do is try to draw this structure in three dimensions if you're a chemist. First of all, you need to think, how would a six-membered ring look in three dimensions? And then you need to think, where are the OH groups going to go on that six-membered ring? And we'll look at the answer to that in the podcast that follows up from this one. Given that people are worried about sugar in terms of both oral health and the obesity epidemic, diet products or no sugar products were introduced to the market. And so initially, Diet Coke relied primarily on aspartame as a sweetener. Aspartame is a sweetener based on a peptide. You'll see that its structure is completely different to the structure of glucose or fructose or sucrose, totally different molecule, but it activates the sensors on your tongue which detect sweetness. It's also known as NutraSweet and Candarel. If you're a chemist, it's a good exercise just to name the functional groups that are present in aspartame. In later years, a second sweetener, ace sulfame K, has been added into the aspartame. Ace sulfame K, or ace sulfame potassium, that's where the K comes from, is quite an unusual structure for a sweetener. It's been allowed for use in Europe since about 1993, and it's typically blended with aspartame, so you get the two artificial sweeteners in your Diet Coke. So one of the key ingredients in Coke is phosphoric acid. And phosphoric acid actually makes Coca-Cola a pretty acidic drink. And so I thought we'd just measure the acidity of a can of Coca-Cola. So freshly open can of Coke, and a little measuring beaker, which is going to allow me to measure the acidity with this pH meter. So here is the reading on the pH meter. We have a pH of about 2.8. When you consider that the pH of normal water that you would drink is around 7, this is over 4 units of acidity, more acidic than water. And people have worried about whether the acidity of Coca-Cola could be problematic in health terms. But there's no evidence at all that drinking an acidic liquid like Coca-Cola causes any problems whatsoever. But it is what gives Coca-Cola the sharpness in its flavour. So why is Coke a good cure for a hangover? Well, it was designed as a tonic, and it still remains a tonic, I guess, for three key reasons. The first is it contains predominantly water, so it will rehydrate your body. The second is it contains large amounts of sugar. When you have a hangover, your liver activity is very suppressed. You've been struggling to break down all the ethanol and your liver is unable to do other things and your blood glucose tends to dip. So taking on some sugar can help with the symptoms of hangover. And the third thing in Coca-Cola that's useful for hangover is caffeine. It's not exactly clear clinically how much benefit caffeine is to hangover, but it can increase mental alertness. And so it's going to make you feel a bit more with it after a difficult night of drinking too much. And so Coca-Cola, the original tonic, probably is quite a good treatment for a hangover. Well, at least it seems to work for me.